Nkrumah Media's Polity Yamtabi Madiba, leading land attorney and author Bule Lomabasa, joins me to unpack her memoir titled My Land Obsession. So your book talks about your upbringing in Soweto in Midlands and the ever-present question of land dispossession in the country. So can you tell us more about your passion for land reform? How and when did it begin? I did not know that this is where it began, but when I started writing down this book and I was... um you know, reflecting on where the journey began, I put it down to around when I was five years old. We're still living um, at my parents' home in Midlands in Soweto with my grandparents, with my parents and aunts and uncles. And there was this painting um, which is signed Verna. And most households in the townships had this painting um, of a young black girl with a teardrop and some tattered clothes. And so when I asked my father, you know, this girl really grabbed me, maybe because I look a bit like her or something about her, that painting grabbed me. And my father's answer was, um, she is sad because she's a generation of people whose land was taken away from her. So you can imagine as a five-year-old who was curious, who was always reading and who was always um, engrossed in literature, I then kind of that thing always was at the back of my mind that we live in a world where there are landless people. And so as I then grew up and I started reading further into my African literature, which my father made sure I did, um, when I was reading, you know, Achebe and Ngoki with Yongo and all these other African writers, I realized that there was a common thread in the literature and that common thread was colonization. And within colonization was the struggle for land and it was the land wars and land conquests. And so that kind of curiosity developed within me as I was growing up as a young girl. And I found it in the literature. I found it and and it really, but also I experienced it at home because my grandmother would put together, you know, coins at the end of the month because they needed to pay rental to the department of uh, whatever that department was in the 80s because Black people couldn't own land. So they were tenants. And so I used to hear about these payments to Umuhle is what they said. And I used to then realize that when I went to my multiracial school in suburbia, there were much larger homes, much larger yards, with tennis courts and swimming pools. And then when I went back to Soweto, I realized that the the densification, the small crammed houses and spaces were very different. And so that also piqued my curiosity even more and more. So you can almost think of it of something that I was born into and that I never shirked. I, I never was able to think beyond it. And that's what then led me to choose law as a career, because I felt that within the law, you can actually have a voice and um, try and influence in, in a small way um, the, the, the trajectory of, the, of, of land reform and land discussions. And that's what then ended up, you know, me starting a, um, a practice within Worksman's Attorneys that is focused on land reform. And this also then led me to be invited as part of the Presidential Advisory Land Panel to advise on a new unified land reform strategy, um, which was in 2018, and then this memoir. I think this memoir really was my way of saying the land question is not just about constitutional amendments. It's not just about parliament. It's not just about intellectual conversations. In my book, in my land obsession, I try to humanize it, to bring it back to individuals. And I share my story of being raised in urban middle land Soweto, having accessed uh, rural Marapiana, where my mother came from, and seeing and understanding that we can all kind of have a voice and a place in how we think about land and land reform. And you also talk of your grandparents enduring land dispossession. Can you tell us about the situation they faced? In my book, I detail this uh, in, 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 I think, part one, when I talk about my upbringing. My grandparents, um, Winnie Sesi Kemese and my, um, and my grandfather, Elliot Kemese, were a young married couple um, during that time. I think it was 1950-something, uh, maybe it was 1956 or 57, if I'm not mistaken. I could be getting the year wrong there. 
But this was the time when the Group Eras Act was introduced. The South African government of the time, I think the president was President Malan, they were building an economy um, of the country. But in the economy of South Africa, they only saw black people as cheap laborers. So black people weren't part of the plan to, uh, to reap the benefits of economic growth. So what that act did is it removed black people from land which was seen to be land that needed to be uh, to make way for um, white residents and white businesses. So my grandparents told me that they were sitting one day at home and there were caspers that just came and they weren't they didn't care whether you were ready or not. They packed up their two children at the time was my father. My late father, Ruben Malusi Kemese, and his older sister, Dela Kemese, they were two young children and they just took the, you know, the kids uh, for safety and the demolition happened. And then they were moved temporarily to a place called Jablani, which was um, right next to a cemetery. And then later on, that's what they gave birth or gave rise to Midlands. So that's how then my story personally was affected by uh, land dispossession. And that's how my grandparents set up home in Zone 4 Midlands. And why is the land question so important now, nearly 30 years since the downing of democracy? And how has the land reform policy changed over the years? The land question is important on very, on, on very many levels. Okay, the first level is that our constitution in its preamble says that it, it aspires to heal the divisions of our past. And because of that, it's a constitutional mandate to heal the divisions of the past so that we can have a more um, unified society for the future. So there's a constitutional element to it, but I think also there's also a social justice element of restitution of land restoration, which is also in the constitution, which also tells us then that those that were re uh, dispossessed of land have a right to claim that land back and they have a right to have that land restored or even financial compensation or a combination of both. So it's a legal obligation as well as a constitutional one, but it's also a social justice one, a restorative justice question on land. But I think beyond that, I think there's also a very powerful um, spiritual element to it that speaks to our joint and united heritage as South Africans, because we've adopted a constitution that says that we anticipate that we'll be a united country one day. It is then important for us to see land also for, for how we see ourselves as individuals, but also as the nation, and also as a nation that is going to bequeath something of value to the future generations. So it is also important for our sense of belonging it's important for our nation building. It's also important for our sense of heritage. We must remember that land reform um, meant a, a spillage of blood. It meant a, 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 a loss of, a sense of enduring loss for generations. It meant that our country was divided in racial ways, that if you, for example, had a, you have your descendants were people that had land, that had wealth, that dispossession that your descendants went through meant that you had to start life from a disadvantaged position because of that dispossession. So that disposition continues and it takes different forms unless we take a stance that says we need to resolve it today. And you ask, how has it changed? Well, unfortunately, the story of the last 30 years is not a story that should make us proud. It's a story that is a sad story because we have not seen much changes in land reform and land restoration. And some of those issues are because we haven't introduced the correct laws. Some of those issues have been that we have not implemented the right policies and so forth. But ultimately, my proposition is that what can citizens be able to do in resolving it? One of the suggestions that I've made and that was endorsed in the Presidential Advisory Land Reform Panel was the idea that those that have excess land, they must be able to share that land with the ones that need the land. And you'll be surprised how much goodwill actually exists in order for that to happen. So I, I say that the land question belongs to us as citizens as well. And how do you think the demand for land expropriation without compensation will play out in the country's land debate? So that's a political question. And the political question is that 
Before 2017, the ANC's policy has been willing buy a willing seller. In other words, when the state was acquiring land for land reform purposes, it was doing that based on the market value. However, the difference is that the constitution that was introduced in 1996 makes provision for land to be acquired at possibly less than market value. And so when the EFF put the motion on, on the table in February 2018, saying that there should be expropriation without compensation, you must remember then at the time that the ANC did not have the two-thirds majority. So the ANC introduced the idea of expropriation without compensation for the first time in the Bulugana conference of 2017 December. But the political question was that the ANC cannot cannot effect any expropriation without compensation policy on its own. It has to have the two-thirds majority. But the political conundrum is that the EFF's idea of expropriation without compensation is very different from the one that the ANC has advocated for. On the one hand, the, e the EFF is advocating for the in an eradication of property rights and for land to be nationalized. When the ANC has a more moderate stance that says, expropriation without compensation must be used in particular circumstances. So I knew then that the amendment of the constitution was not going to pass if the ANC and the EFF did not see eye to eye in terms of their ideas on expropriation without compensation. And earlier on, you mentioned that you were selected as part of the presidential advice panel on land reform. So can you tell us more about the moment when you received a message from President Salah Ramaphosa while you were on holiday in Thailand? It was in August 2018, and I had... Um, gone on vacation with my young family, with my husband uh, and my children. And um, at the time, we're not on, on a roaming service um, at all. And um, I received a text, you know, from the presidency to ask me whether, um, you know, to, whether I would be able to take a call from the president. And I knew that it was about land reform because I had been working on this. I had I had been part of the ANC uh, policy conferences, um, you know, leading up to that moment um, as a as an expert uh, advisor and as, as well as an attorney. So it was quite a funny moment because it just happened within chaos, you know, with young children um, who were hungry and dehydrated. I don't have a roaming service, but ultimately it worked out. Um, my sisters back in South Africa in Joburg. Um, were able then to communicate back to to the office. So it was just a humorous uh, moment, but also a serious moment. But I think the way that I, I put it in the book um, gives it a very kind of human face um, to it. And can you talk to us about how corruption in the area of land reform affected South Africa's land reform progress? So there has been an investigation by the SIU that looked into agreements or arrangements or contracts or land awards that were found to have been awards that were made um, illicitly or to pals or people who are in the elite facets of society and not necessarily to the people who need it. I'm not certain, you know, the destination of the SIU report, whether it was publicized. Um, I think a lot of um, commentators have also asked for it, but there have been indications that the redistribution processes that have happened uh, internally within the department have not yielded results. And I think it's quite crucial that that SIU investigation becomes public knowledge. I apologize if it has been, but I have not been able to see it. But I think it speaks to a more fundamental question. And that is, if we are to, do, to see redistribution, in other words, redistribution is where people who need land are given land that process has to be governed by a statute. Because once you have something as an act of parliament, it goes through all the checks and balances in parliament. It goes through transparency. We are able to all see who's getting land for what purposes and when and for how long. But for as long as we don't have legislation and we are relying on internal policies of the department, there can be no transparency and no trust in the public around who is getting land for what purpose and and for how long and how. So this is another thing that the Presidential Advisory Land Reform Panel has recommended for, and that is the establishment or rather the introduction of a redistribution act 
that is going to govern all of that in a more transparent way. And lastly, Bulelo, what are you hoping people take away after reading your book? For me, I was I was telling a story of a young girl who grew up in a matchbox ha- matchbox house in Midlands, but who grew up in not a lot of material. So we didn't have a lot of, in the sense of material things, but there was an intentional socialization that my grandparents and my aunts and uncles and my parents gave me, which was a, an upbringing of joy and. Uh, that joy I also found in reading. But also beyond that, it's also, I think, a message for any young girl, uh, black or white, who wants to enter professions in corporate South Africa. I share some of my challenges of how I've overcome some of these bias practices that find themselves in a way of progression, especially now during Women's Month. I share my story, how I've overcome many challenges of being unseen and not being taken seriously, having to kind of play second fiddle all the time. But also it's a story of strength and resilience and um, what happens when you believe in yourself and you put your head down and you and you work hard at the things that you're passionate about. And as for land reform, I think is what I said earlier, which is we all need to see ourselves as part of the solution to land reform and we can all do a little bit in whatever way that we can. I genuinely do feel that land reform is going to be the one thing that can nation can can actually um, unite us as a nation as opposed to continue on this continued um trail of it being divisive and emotive and and destructive. That was Bulelo Mabasa speaking to Criminal Media's polity about my land obsession.